uh, I'll introduce myself so we can uh, make up some time. Uh, my name is John Cutler. I work uh, at Amplitude. Uh, Amplitude makes product analytics. You know, our mission is to help people build better products. Um, and I actually work on our marketing team uh, as a coach. And so it's kind of a unique role. I'm not sure there's product evangelists, but there's not many folks who get to uh, interact with this many teams. So I, I speak to you know, hundreds of teams. In the last year, I've spoken and coached hundreds of teams. So I've probably talked to teams at many of your companies, potentially. Um, so it, as, as kind of a product nerd, this has been a, a kind of an amazing experience to be able to interact with this many teams and gain this perspective. But my talk today is how to build a 4.7x B2B product team in three acts, exactly 4.7x. Now, you might ask why exactly 4.7x and why am I even worrying about this? So every couple months on Twitter, you'll hear a debate about this idea of 10x engineers or 10x product managers or kind of rock stars or this and that. And I've done this for 20 years, and I'm pretty sure that those do not exist. But in speaking with teams, I'm pretty sure, certain that there are teams that are operating in a many multiple higher in terms of efficacy. Not speed necessarily, but efficacy. And this has been very, uh, it's been a fascinating problem for me because just when you think you've identified a pattern, you step back and you realize that uh, it's not exactly what you thought it was. So, so this talk is dedicated towards exploring that. So, uh, I believe there are 4.7x exactly product teams, and I'm going to tell you how to become a 4.7x uh, better product team. So I can cut the talk short. It's really easy. You just implement the Spotify model. That's all you need to do. So the way you implement the Spotify model, uh, model is you buy a time machine, you go back to 2008, you move to Northern Europe, uh, Stockholm preferably, you hire a lot of agile coaches named Heinrich who can draw, uh, you get into the music uh, business, uh, music streaming business, B2C. Uh, you draw and you record lots of videos. And then also you spend the next 10 years reminding people there is no Spotify model. So uh, you get the joke, this is not how you become a 4.7x uh, B2B product team. The answer is OKRs. No, that is not how you necessarily become a 4.7x product team. Now, it might help. Uh, but we all know that key results could mean many things, so it's a lot more important what your key results are than whether you do OKRs or not. The answer is actually uh, divided into three segments of this chart. And conceptually, let me try to explain this, is that at first you have things that are easy, but are actually pretty difficult for humans. They, these are messy human problems. The, the actual implementation is easy, but it's difficult for us to wrap our head around. And the second category of things, to get to exactly 4.7x for your B2B product team, are things that are challenging and they take some practice, but with practice that you can improve them. And then the final thing, you actually hit a point where you need a paradigm shift for your company that no amount of optimization is going to get. So really, you're going to get to 6.99x, and then you're going to have to kind of change how you do product, but that's going to help you get into a new space. So, um, this is possible, but I'm going to structure my talk talking about these three different types of changes or places to focus, so hopefully it will make more sense. Uh, before I jump in, one, one important differentiation I want to make before we dig into this talk, and this is a kind of going to be a conceptual talk. I do a lot of drawings. Uh, you've got to stick with me on this because I, I think, I hope it will be helpful. The first thing I'd like to dig into, though, is the difference between acute problems or acute stressors and chronic stressors. And I hate sports analogies, but I'm going to use one. When I was racing bikes, if you ever do an endurance sport, there is a moment where you are, in, you are in pain, and you're at the end of a race, but you've trained and you've rested. And you're able to go a lot deeper than you've ever gone before. You're in a state of flow. And that's an acute stressor. You are stressed, but you've done all the work. And there's also chronic stressors which is you've overtrained, and those people, when they get to the end of a marathon, they, don't, they can't even dig deep. They report things like, I didn't feel like I had any energy. Um, I couldn't get to that other level that I've gotten to in training and do those, and I had no flow. 
So I want you to think about the difference between acute stressors and chronic stressors as we go through these particular examples, because it, it, you'll actually start to see a pattern, and hopefully you see it, and I'll try to call it out as we go through. Okay, let's start with that first category of things, which are easy, but somehow no one does them. And you might say, no, we're in the Bay Area, and we've got it all figured out. Trust me, you don't all have it figured out, because I talk to your companies, and so I know. The first thing is really easy. You have to just keep people less busy. It's easy, but we're all wired to be busy. I preach this, but I'm a dad now, and I try to do my dad stuff, and I try to do work stuff, and outside. I, I don't practice what I preach in my personal life, because not being busy is really difficult. We're wired to be busy. So this is an easy thing. I could just do less, but it's hard to do. So let me try to make this real for you, so you can start to see how you can become a 4.7x B2B product team. If you look at a big cross-section of companies and you look at something called flow efficiency, so flow efficiency is the ratio of the amount of time spent problem solving compared to the amount of time waiting from the moment someone has an idea all the way until it is producing customer value. That's called lead time. So if I were to go to your organizations, unless you've spent actual focused time trying to address this problem, average flow efficiency of your company will be 10%. So of every 100 days that something spends in lists, or on roadmaps, or in the CEO's head, or wherever it is, only 10% of that time is spent working. So when you obsess about estimates, estimates of the development time are actually a really small percentage of the overall time you need to worry about. So the reason why I mention this is that when you pay attention to this problem, you can shift this to about 40% flow efficiency. So right there, I've gotten you 4x. You could just do less, plan less, and you could improve flow efficiency by 4x. And you say, oh, we do this already, we do Scrum. Well, how many people pack every Scrum sprint with as many story points as you can? Boom, you're already doing the problem, right? So there's room for improvement here. Now, why does this work? Why does this have this influence on your company? So I love this drawing because this says all the far-reaching effects of trying to do too much at once. And if you're a startup founder, you're like, but I'm wired to do so much at once. That, that's how we're going to be successful. But let me walk you through what happens. You try to do more at once, your throughput goes down, your time to deliver goes up, your time to realize benefits goes up, your outcomes go down, which makes morale go down, which means you become more opaque in your organization, so you lack confidence people are doing their best, so distrust goes up, outcomes goes down, pressure for short-term results goes up, need for silver bullets goes up, you lose key players, you hire new players rapidly, causes WIP to go up. You use back channels to get work done, context switching, whip goes up, dependencies go up, you have to hire human load balancers, aka POs, not product managers. Then you have to do more upfront planning, local agendas causes whip to go up, you reward being busy, you reward outcomes over outputs, and resource utilization goes up. So the reason why I paint this picture is that the simple thing of just trying to do too much at once can have super far-reaching impact in your company to the extent that trust drops, morale drops. You think that people aren't doing their job, when in fact, you're just doing too much at once. I liken it to playing Tetris, and I talk to a lot of product managers, and even though they say they're not wired to play Tetris, what they're actually doing is they believe their job is Tetris. It's to maximize people's busyness, and that is not the job. Yet they imagine their job as being a complex game of Tetris that they are locking in everyone's work for every engineer for them, and what does that do? It just creates high work in progress, which creates all the problems we're talking about. Another example, here's two examples of work. In the top example, we do one project, then we do the next project. We serialize it. In the bottom example, we try to parallelize the work. We do A and B at the same time because there's one engineer, and one engineer can't work on A, so we might as well get that engineer working on B at the same time. So while this seems logical and intuitive, in the top option, we get the late start advantage on B, so we get more learning. We get the early value generation for A, so we're able to create value earlier. And I'm even being generous here. I'm, I'm assuming that A and B here at the bottom actually gets you getting a little bit sooner for B, so we get a little bit more value. But in reality, we paralyze because we think we have to play Tetris, but we're losing this opportunity. This alone can create a multiple value for your team if you can start to serialize your work. Let me give you another example. This is actual data from a team. Here's a 40-hour week. Here's what they spent their time on. Lunch, diagnosing production issues, status checks and ETA and updates for future work, estimating future work, meetings about the future work, 
waiting for CI and tooling issues, delayed by technical debt, not working through it, hiring new people because you're going so slow, of course, right? One project, another project, and context switching. So out of a 40-hour work, six hours is going to actually doing the feature work. And all the other time is spent, well, we want to have lunch, right? That's reasonable. But all the other time is spent doing other stuff. Now, if you're looking at this and you're a manager or your CEO, you're like, well, that is stupid. Let's do this. Great. Let's get on the train. Let's get everyone doing the value-added work. They can have Soylent. They don't need lunch anyway or dinner. Um, the context switching resetting is small. Let's, let's do Scrum. Let's pack those sprints. Let's get it going. This looks awesome. Everyone is highly productive. But if you've been doing this for a long time, you know exactly what happens. The tech debt catches up with you because you haven't paid any attention. So then you have tech debt month. Tech debt month, the translation is everyone freaks out and they work 60 hour weeks. They have a little bit of lunch. Uh, they have personal pizza sized teams, meaning one person on every single favorite project to reduce the debt. And they try to do that for a month. Well, that doesn't work either. And then you know what? They just kind of go back to how it was before, but just a little bit worse. So this is, now I exaggerated the one in the middle. There was more lunch and the soil and stuff, but this is not a stretch from the data for this particular team. And this is happening at your companies. This is this type of dynamic where this complex dynamic of time management and busyness and planning and things are conspiring to mean that you have this type of picture, which is really discouraging if you're involved in this. So the first thing you can do is just do less at once. That will get you your many X improvement, and you can on your way to become your 4.7X product team. The next thing is related to decision quality and decision velocity. We make decisions, hundreds of product decisions, every single day, every single week. We're layering on all these product decisions. So I kind of um, met a team that shared data with me, which really just blew my mind. And it's also very encouraging, because it's from one company. And it shows how you can improve how you work. So when we first spoke to them a couple years ago, all their work was big, and they didn't really have a lot of impact. So they had like three level efforts and two level, two you know, point bets and one point bets. Now these aren't story points, these are like impact on lifetime value. Great, but not so great. <laughs> so then, uh, then they decided to run a well-oiled feature factory. You're gonna have reasonably usable features, you're gonna work a little bit faster. They worked on that. They worked down their debt. They worked on their planning. And so they had like five level, five points, four points, a dud, two points, six points, seven. That was their win, three. So right there, they went from six to 27. So you want your 4.7x product B2B product team? And if you're at the top, just focus on smaller batches and focus on slightly better decisions and making it usable. But unfortunately, that's not, well, fortunately for them, that's not where they stopped. They continued improving how they worked, and they started to improve their decision quality and decision velocity. They allowed themselves uh, smaller failures, and they started to see patterns that looked like this, three, six, seven, eight, two, six, ten, nine. So they were able to start not great, but then iterate and continue to improve. So from there, they affected, they almost doubled what they were doing. They went from six to 27, so it's around four X, and then there they went two X, by just focusing on smaller batches, using more insights, using analytics, trying to understand the impact of the work, allowing teams to not have too much planning in progress so they had the chance to pivot on what they were doing. So decision quality and decision velocity and how you shape your work is, has a big impact. Now, if you're in the enterprise and if you're in B2B, I always hear things like, well, we can't do A-B experiments, we're not Netflix, or it's hard to get a customer on the phone, so, or well, you know, we're moving into the enterprise, so all bets are off. So to that, I would suggest one thing. Let me just keep this so simple for you in B2B. You have human beings that are doing something. You want to target a some set of those human beings, and you want to understand what they're doing now. And you want to imagine that you're going to somehow change their behavior for the better with an intervention. And you believe it's going to impact positively your business, and it's going to impact uh, the, how, the health of that customer is going to help them do their work better, typically in B2B. You're going to help them do their work better. So when people get into this kind of measurement quagmire of we can't run A-B tests or we can't do these, at its simplest in B2B, you, are, uh, you have a who. You have what their behavior is. You imagine you're going to change their behavior, and you imagine it's going to benefit the business and it's going to benefit them. And once you start to simplify this, the measurement problem becomes a lot easier. 
um, you know, the, the myth is that when you have a lot of uncertainty, you need a lot of data to tell you something useful. But that is not the case. If you have a lot of uncertainty now, you don't need much data to reduce uncertainty. In other words, if you know almost nothing, almost anything will tell you something. Now, you need to be slightly rigorous with that. There's a lot of abuse that could come out of that. But um, I really like how Doug Hubbard says, you know, the goal is to reduce some level of uncertainty, and you have lots of options to do that. So when you frame it that way, if I say to any B2B uh, SaaS founder, are you uncertain about anything? Typically, they'll say, oh, yeah, I am kind of uncertain about something. So where do we start? How do, can we use measurement to help there? Now, in a lot of organizations, I always find this funny. Um, I won't read through the whole quote, but let me just tell you the, the summary of it. Um, oh, my God, we've had the data scientists working on our customer health model for six months, and they have, they've come up with their finding. Oh, what is it? Oh, if they stop using the product, it means they're going to churn. Oh. Oh, that, that's really good. We just spent six months of people's time, and then I'll go and talk to the data scientists. What have you been doing for six months? Oh, this stupid like customer health model. I told them the first day that we're not going to really get any signal here, and I asked them what decisions they needed to make, and they were kind of opaque about it. So we've done a six-month customer health model, and we're not acting on it. So to these product folks, I say, Let, can we just back up for a second? Can we just review a couple decisions that you've needed to make? What were the winners? What were the misses? What were your opportunities? What decisions are you juggling? Oh, I have, I have no idea if anything's won that we've done. Velocity's great. It's like 120 points per sprint. Uh, sales asked me about the health model. That's why we did it. So you see this complete misapplication of rigor when the most basic questions in B2B are out there, but people are like overcomplicating this. Um, I'm going to jump through some things to make sure you get to lunch because people are probably pretty hungry. But some of these most basic Mad Libs, like, what if we learned that blank, then we would blank. This is it, to, to say that this is super simple, yet the smartest people often forget their brain when they're thinking about their analytics, they would understand that So that is one thing you can do. Slightly, marginally improve your decision quality and your decision velocity across the many decisions that you make, and it can have a many multiple difference in terms of the efficacy of your team. Next, we're starting to move up in that diagram now. Some of these start to get a little harder now. So I know of a company that, if you looked at a reference feature, went from shipping uh, those features in 15 to 30 days, and a couple years later, those same features would take 150 to 300 days, weekly production issues, um, people leaving the company for morale issues, and uh, this, this is a reference feature. And I know another company in a similar space doing similar things that in those same period of time went from 15 to 30 days to 20 to 40 days. Mix of uh, cycle time, which is actually not the lead time we talk about, this is cycle time. Quarterly production issues, so one production issue a quarter instead of a weekly production issue. So now you can look at this, and if you're an engineer, if you're a product person, you'd say, oh my god, that's gross incompetence. How could anyone ever let this happen? Well, it's complicated. This is, this is a human problem as much as it's sort of a logic problem. The typical response when people say that is, that's a management problem. We just need more checkpoints. We need more specs. We need to have a rigorous, standardized process for product management in our company. Then everything will be solved. Uh, that is not so much the case. Um, we all understand this, that really as team size increase, your productivity levels off, your efficacy goes down, your ability to make sense of system dynamics goes down. But this isn't even it really, too, because some companies are kind of able to alter this trajectory for their teams. But let me try to explain how to make sense of this from a financial perspective. We're literally talking that in this company, a well-known company, things took one tenth, got 10 times slower. <laughs> and the effect that that had is this company that went from sort of in product development being able to add value every single month, all this drag on the value creation system was happening. And this resulted in this line, this trajectory going down. That's what the red there you see. That's the sort of drag that's being created. And if you look at the area right here, that's the total dollar value for that the technical debt is causing in the system. And so the, you know, what I would add here is that sometimes to get this many multiple faster or many things, it really just does take focusing on flow through the system and the impact of debt, the impact of complexity on the product. Um, it seems like, yes, we do that. We had tech debt month, or yes, I think our engineers refactor. 
But in many organizations, what you find is these efforts are surface level efforts. And over a couple years, you see this just gradual decline in what's happening. So if you're a startup, make sure that this doesn't happen you know, after you've figured out how to make money, which would be a good thing. Um, in a similar vein, what you find too in companies, so you know, we do analytics and we talk to the companies trying to use information. And so often from startups especially, I hear you know, speed is everything. Speed of execution is everything. And what I began to realize is across two companies with similar en quality engineers and similar quality leadership, similar quality of all these particular things, you had some companies operating like this on the left and some companies operating like this on the right, they're moving at the exact same speed. Everyone is just as busy. Everyone's writing just as much code. Everyone's talking to just as many customers. But by focusing on the length of feedback loops in a particular company, and some of this is incredible low-hanging fruit. Some of this is, oh, it took me six weeks to get this answer from BI about uh, this one thing, question I asked them. And now we can do it in three days. Like, that's a massive difference, and that's not a heavy lift for that particular team. There's all sorts of areas where there's distances that you need to think about, right? There's the distance from the team to users, the distance from the team to customers, support and success. Especially what I've noticed in B2B is that the, there's this kind of fear of letting the nerds and sales hang out, or you know, there's this fear that customer success will overly influence these impressionable young PMs that you need to kind of divide these people. But in companies where I've seen this work, you know, the partnerships can form between these groups and information can flow in a respectful way and work really well for you. But all of these are opportunities, the team and their budget, the team and the strategy, the team uh, for hiring, the team for tools. So all of these are opportunities. And often that's where you see the low hanging fruit, which allows a team to create a many multiple in terms of how they're working. There's someone on my team has a really fun uh, thought experiment. And, and he asks, uh, are you shipping faster than you learn, or are you learning faster than you ship? And it's a really, really interesting question if you think about it. Um, whenever I ask people to raise their hands, they don't, because I think they're still thinking about it. I've thought about this a lot. The answer is, is this is like an equilibrium. In fact, if this is out of whack in any way, something starts to happen at your company. So to explain what that means, um, I've been walking from the screen the whole time. Um, you might start shipping faster than you learn, but if you do that long enough, you've added so much non-value added complexity to your product that then you will start to learn faster than you ship. So a lot of times what I find is, is that you know, I'll meet a C-suite of a company and they'll say, we just have an execution problem. We know everything about the market. If, if we could just ship, then everything would be okay. Now, what they're not correctly pointing out is that all of their prior crappy decisions have led to this situation. All, so they now learn, they've learned now, right? They're much smarter about the market. But they usually don't connect their prior behavior to the current situation. And so this is a really tough human problem to tackle. But generally, if you could just walk away thinking, are we learning faster than we ship, or ship shipping faster than we learn? And then also reminding yourself that in B2B, I love B2B because if I negotiate it correctly with the rest of the company, I can always pick up the phone and talk to a customer. And that is an amazing, amazing thing. And there's always an opportunity to learn. So I would, I would ask yourself that question. So all of that was about feedback loops. So is there low-hanging fruit for you to be able to accept feedback loops? Now, this, is, this gets a lot tougher. This start, I, I don't think this is like a, a paradigm shift level thing. But one thing we talked about in that high whip situation is you see, the, you see this idea of morale going down and optimism draining in your organization. So what's really fascinating is that I walk into an organization or talk to some people from the teams and say, I'll just sense drag. I'll sense that chronic illness. There are morale issues or there's low optimism in that environment. And there'll be all these process tweaks, but I don't hear anyone making the process tweaks saying we need to improve this so morale goes up. It's always about efficiency or it's always a thing. Uh, my friend David's here and he made this great point about their comp with their company that if, if we, we, we worked at the same company and we're thinking that the real thread that linked together a lot of really good efforts to that company is that they were keeping impact in mind. Like people had a sense that their work was having an impact. 
And in a lot of B2B where I talk to the teams or your teams or whatever, and you talk to engineers and designers in those teams, often a lot of them do not sense the impact of their work. They don't feel that their work is making a difference. Now, the CEO or sales or other people must say, like, oh, we've got an amazing product. You talk about it at all hands. Oh, we've got this amazing product. But the people on the team don't see the impact of the work. And they say things like this. I just don't see how my work fits in. Feels like success theater. This is a longer quote, but it's great. It's working, I guess. We have annual contracts. The old competitors suck. But I still wonder whether we can do more. I mean. Look, if we're going to run a feature factory, let's just state that outright. Let's hold ourselves accountable. You know, so these are the types of things people say. There's a sense that there's a lack of accountability about outcomes, often on B2B teams. And I just see this as an opportunity. Like, I see this as a multiple opportunity to improve. Because often, there are low-hanging ways to be able to share the impact of your work. And I remember I worked at a place, too. And I think during our customer conference, I recorded 20 customer videos in like a, in a confessional booth. That was the whole thing, like product confessions. And I remember feeding that back to the team. And even those videos I heard later on had become something that inspired people that their work was having an impact. Um, you often see, I skipped over that a little bit, but one thing I notice at, at Amplitude that I'm really passionate about is that you often see teams initially wanting to use the data as a trust proxy. And what I mean by that is the team does not trust each other. And the only way that they're going to trust each other is they've got the data. You know, I can prove it to you. Which is really good for the statisticians and people who can like mess around with the numbers, right? Because that's like amazing, right? Because they can, they can gain that trust. Uh, so in these environments, often when people say, well, we need to sense the impact of their work, and they get into the data side of what they're really doing is they're just mostly thinking about measurement as a trust proxy instead of measurement for control. That's the measurement for control side. But there's other reasons you use measurement, right? You use measurement for alignment and learning and inspiration. And so what you want to avoid is one of the biggest sources of drag in your company, which is low trust. Because when trust is high, you can just do it and say thank you. <laughs> when trust is low, you have to go, trust is no, then you need to go to this meeting where this person decides this and then sends them down to here and sends them down to here and here, and but you're going back to here. Oh, you're going to quarterly planning again. Oh, the quarter only has 61 business days, so let's meet for 12 days to argue. And you're going around in here over and over and over again. Oh, they got to schedule that meeting again. They got, oh, they almost made it. Oh, start review. Oh, we're going back to review. We're getting to these particular things. And, and I'm, not, I'm not making it up, right? <laughs> like, if someone wants to ask how do you get a 10x team even, or a 5x team, sometimes it's just stopping using data as a trust proxy and stop using your OKRs as a trust proxy or an accountability proxy or any of those particular things and focusing on the root problem that there's low trust. And if you improve trust, you could get a many multiple improvement in your organization. So now I think we get to the paradigm shift where a lot of these things are more difficult and they're challenging and they're not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. So let's just talk about where, where you know, maybe your company is and let's go through the examples. So up at the top is a full sort of waterfall organization. Opportunity selection goes to requirements planning, goes to design, goes to build, goes to test, goes to release and run. And as with each iteration, you know, in my work, I talk to a time travel of 20 years every time, every week, I'm talking to companies at these different scales. So Agile with a release silo, build and test is an internal handoff. They're still internally handing off between build and test, but that's your team boundary in yellow. OK, great. Now Agile able to release. Now they give, they give the team the ability to release their own software. Oh, that's amazing. OK, great. And I'm guessing that a lot of your companies have sort of moved through these things, right? Oh, but now we're going to include design. But design internally hands off in the team. There's still handoffs. They just happen to be in the team. OK, now you introduce DevOps into the organization. That's great. So the team sort of starts running it. Now you're going to run the well-oiled feature factory. Someone's going to do the opportunity selection. They're going to hand it off someone to do the planning. And they're going to hand it off to the team to do this loop. And then you have the mini CEO, which we're all familiar with, which is the mini CEO does the opportunity selection, then hands it off to the team, and they do the requirements, design, build, test, release, and run. And then finally, at the bottom, you have the, you know, the Marty Kagan real. Well, he's actually a mini CEO person, which I've never quite gotten. But um, you have this idea of like a fully 
kind of entrepreneurial team that, that tackles these problems together, very similar to your startups. If you have a startup and it's small enough, you're probably operating in a model that's similar to that. So very, very importantly as we go through this is that there's always room for improvement. There's improvement beyond this too. You start to become more integrated in your organization. The whole point is that silos are difficult. So one thing that I've noticed in the Bay Area which I find fascinating is that you'll see engineering managers, because everyone in the Bay Area is really excited to, to move up in their career, they're driven, that you got A's, you know, you're smart and stuff. And so everyone wants to improve. So you'll see an engineering manager actually cultivate the backlogs of all the individual people on the team. This doesn't happen in other parts of the world, actually. It's kind of interesting. So this is pretty, like a Bay Area phenomenon. Um, and you know, you'll have the manager saying, oh, I need to performance manage people. You know, Jerry wants to work on Kafka, and Mary wants to work on you know, threat detection, and, and Bill wants to work on the front end, and he likes React and stuff like that. And so you start to get this like optimization. And so even in that diagram I showed you before, you could get a team thinking that they're operating like this, but they're actually operating like this. They're not operating as a team. One team of three, they're operating as three teams of one which is kind of the handoff problem you have. This happens a lot with design, and this is one, I'm, I have a strong affinity in the design community, but often when there's few designers at your company, you, you sort of get this mini waterfall going where design gets siloed out because there's just not enough of them. Just this movement to having a designer be a part of the team, not a part-time member of the team, can create a many multiple difference in terms of the efficacy of the team because they're bringing more information and stuff into the team. And, oh, oh, this is where you get killed by the animation from the previous presentation in Google Docs. All right, we won't go through that. I mean, basically, this is saying that there's all these, these things that are happening here. Um, what this does, a lot of these examples, now you could say, well, how could that create a many multiple difference? Those teams look kind of pretty effective, but you have this basic dynamic that happens. When teams are forced to converge early because they're asked to plan their 2020 roadmap in advance or you know, they're asked to figure out what they're gonna do because someone needs to go and tell the board exactly what you're gonna get done. Oh, oh, but these are just representative solutions, right? We're not really telling them that's the solution. Well, we know how that goes, right? So at the top, you get this conver premature convergence on these ideas. And development and ship happens there. And if, as, a, as a UX person and product person, one of the major things impacting decision quality on teams is this premature convergence that you're having. And so if you're converging later, back to my diagram, that opportunity selection, design and development, then moves to design and development, design and development, design and development. Many, if you're in a startup, maybe you're working like this bottom example. Um, we, we see this at Amplitude a lot because this is, like, this is very measurement conducive. The team working like that at the top has already made their bet. They're just going to place it and move on to the next thing. But the team working here at the bottom actually has something to learn. And so once you give the team something to learn, they can create decisions that have a many multiple improvement. And if you look back to that previous diagram, this is, this is the sort of well-oiled feature factory can then move to like the real product team, the outcome-driven team. Um, I'm not going to bore you with this, but this is all, we, we, we have a crazy business here, right? Like we do all these activities together. And I mentioned that this is sort of a, a paradigm shift because I don't think every team is ready for it, but truly starting together as a team on new efforts, really converging late and doing this as a team, getting out of the building as a team, getting in a van with engineers and going on site to a customer with the team. Do, really doing this is something that I see so few teams do but it pr prevents this like force multiplier in terms of how they're working. This is the paradigm shift when the team can start how they're working together. I've got one minute, 42 seconds. Uh, let me, I, I guess one thing I was back to say is that uh, um, an anti-pattern that, that bubbles up over and over and over again that creates drag on the system is that you see companies have like a mono process internally. They have the way. I was meeting at like a you know, big B2B SaaS company, and someone said, oh, are you interested in the way? I'll give you the way. Here's a 10-page document that explains how we do product development here. I read it. Huh. So I go and talk around. It's like, is this what you do? Like, no. Of, like, 
that's terrible. Like we don't work, we just, we just pretend to do that because that's what they want to see, but we've invented new ways of working. So one thing that you see a lot, again, to provide a force multiplier is that, um, especially as the, you know, B2B, once you get into like the three, four, five hundred plus groups of people, is there's no one way, there's no way you're going to run one process in your company. So that right there is just, just acknowledging that you'll have many different shapes of work and how you work and different sizes of teams and structures of teams can be a, a big force multiplier. So I wanted to conclude with just one thought, and that is, in, in, and I would say especially in B2B, in B2B SaaS, the, the company, including how it operates, is also the product. All these examples, a lot of these examples are things that if I went and asked the team, like, are you, how are you doing product? And they would say, well, the product's great. Features are doing well, how we're doing really well. But when you ask them the type of thinking they had done to like care for the health of their company or do other things, the answer is like, oh, that's not real work. Like, we've got a job to do. We've got business as usual. We've got to ship features. We've got to do that. And so what you learn when you talk to the companies that are doing a lot better is that there's care and concern about the health of the overall system of how the company uh, creates products. And it's a big difference. Um, so just to summarize, uh, the quick win that I talked about, the big thing in the beginning is just do less. Make fewer promises, do less change at once, have fewer elephants in progress. So fewer chronic issues in uh, progress. It's a cute elephant, so it feels unfair to really say that it's a chronic issue. Um, the things that require practice, you need to progressively improve decision quality and progressively reduce noise and drag, try to speed up the feedback loop. So those are not instant things, but they're things that if you practice them that you can improve. The paradigm shifts are a truly high trust environment where that can just, you know, that, that can change that chart altogether. You saw all the little boxes and arrows that can make a huge difference. And then the final paradigm shift, which not all teams are ready for, but really provides this step change, is treating every team, in a sense, as a mini startup within the company. Like, they are a contained startup. They start together, um, and they work together. So that's, oh, that is the last slide. So, th so that's my talk. You, if you follow these things, you can become a 4.7x product team. And that's kind of a joke in the sense it is really, really hard. Um, but there are many opportunities that don't require a lot of, uh, you know, process to be able to address these things. So yeah, I'll take a couple questions. Oh, no, no questions. No questions. Yeah. Um, uh, thank yeah. you, John. That yeah, was amazing. I'll, anyone at lunch, you can hang out and we'll chat. Uh, I will not eat now. I'll eat later. Exactly. We're going to lunch, so we're going to hold questions.